Trimbalone's anti-catabolic effects reducing muscle protein breakdown are stemming from mild to moderate glucocorticoid receptor inhibition, preventing cortisol from signaling for protein degradation. And that finally brings us to the skeletal muscle studies. Yay! But since the skeletal muscle and growth promoting studies are all stemming from animal models or in vitro studies using animal cells, I think it's best if we summarize all of these results like we would normally do with the human clinical trials, which in the case of Tremblone are fully MIA. Tremblone acetate appears to reduce the rate of muscle protein synthesis, but also reduces the rate of muscle protein breakdown while simultaneously increasing nitrogen retention within the cells. It's speculated that this reduction in protein synthesis is stemming from Tremblone's relatively high binding affinity for the androgen receptors and thus testosterone's binding capacity for the androgen receptor is severely diminished. It's the testosterone and the estradiol that contribute to muscle protein synthesis after all. And even though a Tremblone can activate the estrogen alpha receptor in a very small amount, it's probably not sufficient to initiate muscle protein synthesis. Or is this because Tremblone has a negative effect on the HPTA or many of the animals investigated are castrated, they have low testosterone and low estradiol levels, and thus this muscle protein synthesis that's otherwise initiated by testosterone or estradiol is now uh, gone because there's no circulating testosterone and estradiol. Maybe this is also another reason why Trimblone acetate implants are usually combined with estradiol to stimulate muscle protein synthesis further. And you can somewhat confirm this with the Hershberger bioassays or castrated rodents treated with Trimblone acetate see a reduction in body weight in a dose-dependent fashion. Whereas with the cattle treated with Trimblone acetate and estradiol implants, see a steep increase in body weight. So that leads us to the following conclusion. If you go on the Trimblone sandwich, make sure you have testosterone and sufficient circulating estradiol levels in the body for protein synthesis, which might be reduced within skeletal muscle during Trimblone acetate treatment. Tremblone's anti-catabolic effects reducing muscle protein breakdown are stemming from mild to moderate glucocorticoid receptor inhibition, preventing cortisol from signaling for protein degradation. And Tremblone also downregulates the glucocorticoid receptors and lower serum cortisol levels over time. Tremblone almost completely suppresses tyrosine amino transferase enzymes in the liver hepatocytes of rats, which is a key enzyme in amino acid degradation and gluconeogenesis. And this might explain why you sometimes get hypoglycemic while running Trimbalone. Based on the dosages investigated in the various animal models, the anti-catabolic effects lie anywhere between 0.08 milligrams per one kilogram of body weight to 0.8 milligrams per one kilogram of body weight, either Trimbalone acetate or inotate subcutaneously daily. And if you were to extrapolate this to the human equivalent dose using Doscal, linked down below, a 100 kilogram human being would uh, get between 1.3 milligrams to 13 milligrams Tremblone acetate or enethate daily, which is 9.1 milligrams to 91 milligrams weekly. So imagine just running 10 milligrams Tremblone acetate per week to get anti-catabolic effects, right? Nobody gets out of bed for that, but you see that you don't need much. So now you understand why the parabolin medical treatments were so low. A single ampule of 76 milligrams Tremblone hexahydrobenzyl carbonate resulting in 50 milligrams net Trembolone every 15 days, or 35.5 milligrams weekly, underweight, bedridden people with muscle-wasting diseases already see sufficient glucocorticoid receptor inhibition and muscle protein-sparing effects at these very low yet effective dosages. Trembolone-treated animals appear to have higher serum cortisol concentrations initially, probably due to glucocorticoid receptor inhibition or the stress from these implantations, which took place, but in long-term studies, it was shown that serum cortisol and corticosterone levels drop during Trembolone treatment. Both testosterone and Trembolone reduce glucocorticoid secretion from the adrenal glands. If you want to lower cortisol levels further, look into Emodin, which inhibits the 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1 enzymes, preventing the production of cortisol and corticosterone glucocorticoid steroids. And doing some dubious extrapolation by chronically reducing serum cortisol and corticosterone levels, Tremblone might increase adrenocorticotropic hormones, which would otherwise signal from additional cortisol and corticosterone release from the adrenal glands, which is now suppressed from circulating Tremblone and perhaps testosterone. If you have a testosterone base 
in the picture. So cortisol and corticosterone levels are low, but adrenocorticotropic levels go up. And guess what? Elevated adrenocorticotropic hormone levels can ultimately contribute to tanned skin. Adrenocorticotropic hormone consists of 39 amino acids. The first 13 can be cleaved off to form alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, which then stimulates melanogenesis by activating the melanocortin receptors 1, 3, 4, and 5. Melanocortin receptor 2 is exclusively reserved for adrenocorticotropic hormone. So whether it's cleaved or not, you get some melanogenesis through these melanocortin receptors 1 to 5. Melanotan 2 works on the exact same receptors as alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, ultimately resulting in a tanned skin. So whether you take melanotan 2 or not, there might be an overlapping effect. If you want to get matte tanned, a low dose of trembolone, sufficient enough to reduce cortisol levels but increase adrenocorticotropic hormone levels in combination with melanotan 2, you should look pretty damn dark with sufficient sunlight exposure or going to the tanning salon, obviously. However, there's always a caveat, right? A single 10-day animal model showed that while serum corticosterone levels decreased by 45%, serum adrenocorticotropic hormone levels were not altered during trembolone treatment, but maybe this study wasn't performed long enough. Like I mentioned before, estradiol is a contributing factor to trembolone's growth-promoting effects. When trembolone acetate is administered to female animals, they grow significantly faster than male animals of the same species. But when male animals are co-administered with estradiol during trembolone acetate treatment, they also grow at an accelerated rate. And whether that's through alterations in muscle protein synthesis or an increase in growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor 1 production in the presence of circulating estradiol, that's not very clear. Combination implant studies show a clear significant increase in serum GH, IGF-1, and IGF-1 binding protein 3 in cattle, which is not correlated to food intake. So that means that even in a caloric restrictive state, these combination implants will still increase GH, IGF-1, and IGF binding protein 3 levels, contributing to the overall anabolic effect alongside trembolone and estradiol. Now, this doesn't mean that you should bring your serum estradiol levels up to those of women right before ovulation, between 150 to 750 picograms per milliliter, not 150 picomoles per liter. That's totally fine for men that's top of their reference range. That should contribute to sufficient growth hormone secretion and IGF-1 production in the liver, but over 150 picograms per milliliter, that surely results in gynecomastia and potentially issues with your blood pressure. In human men, serum growth hormone and IGF-1 levels don't really seem to improve beyond a serum estradiol concentration of, let's say, 75 to 80 picograms per milliliter anecdotally, which is already the range where most men start to notice issues with their libido or symptoms of gynecomastia. It might be more cosmetically appealing and cost-effective compared to gynecomastia surgery, just to run exogenous growth hormone in IGF-1 LR3, for example, and keep your serum estradiol at, let's say, top of the reference range at most, 60 picograms per milliliter, which seems to be reasonably benign when it comes to gynecomastia formation. And I do understand that in the scientific evidence that there's a clear correlation between serum estradiol and serum growth hormone in IGF-1 levels, but that's also highly age-dependent. And if you really want to increase your GH and IGF-1 levels in serum, Look into growth hormone secreted gogs if you want to go with a cheaper option while keeping your estradiol somewhat at the top of the reference range because super physiological um, might still give you gyno because growth hormone secreted gogs are also known to additionally secrete prolactin from the pituitary glands. High estradiol and high prolactin is a recipe for gynecomastia in the presence of a progestogenic 19 nor testosterone derivative, in this case, being trembolone. Several in vitro studies using animal muscle biopsy cell cultures show that trembolone acetate plus estradiol increase muscle satellite cell content, activate muscle satellite cell proliferation and differentiation, and increase satellite cell fusion rates with existing muscle fibers to provide myonuclei necessary to support further muscle growth. In most of these studies, but not all of them, intercellular IGF-1 messenger RNA expression is significantly increased, which likely contributes to satellite cell proliferation. 